Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Anybody ever been to Tahoe? Love Tahoe. A few years ago, my wife's family, my wife's side of the family, gathered in Tahoe for my mother-in-law's birthday celebration. It was a big milestone birthday, and we were really looking forward to it. It's a beautiful place to be. <clears throat> Love the fresh air up there. We had lots of good family time and games and food planned out ahead of us. And so as we were preparing for this vacation, <clears throat> we went online, as you would, to book an Airbnb. Uh, this family's kind of big, so we generally will book multiple houses in the area, all get together that way. And we found this awesome house. It had tons of rooms, you know, for cousins to come and sleep over and big living rooms so we could play games on the coffee table and a huge kitchen to make big meals for everybody. And um, it looked awesome. It was great. Uh, laundry, everything that you need. And so <clears throat> when the day got closer, we, uh, we flew up to Reno, got in our rental car, drove over the hill to, to Tahoe, and we pulled up to this house. We're all excited. And it looks pretty good from the outside. And it's probably five or six in, in the afternoon, evening, and the sun's just starting to come down. It's gorgeous. And we open the car door, grab our bags, and oh, there's that fresh Tahoe air with a little flavor of pine. You can hear the boats humming in the background and different birds that we don't have down here chirping in the trees. Oh, it's lovely, you know? We walk up to the front door, <clears throat> and on the porch, there's sticky beer spilled all over the, all over the floor. I'm like, oh, this didn't get cleaned up. It's not a great start. Try to reserve judgment. And uh, keep going, keep checking this thing out. So we turn the key, we walk into the house and immediately step onto a sticky, grimy floor, the kind that when you lift your foot up, it goes, you know what I mean? It was gross. I'm like, that's not good either, dude. We can smell this, uh, this heavy cloud of, of pork fat, haze, and odor just stuck in the house like it didn't get aired out after they made this breakfast, probably that morning, and then didn't clean for us. Because when we looked around the house, we saw broken furniture, we saw beds sunken in, we saw holes burned through the, the lampshades and the, the bed sheets like people were putting out cigarettes in there and stuff, and the appliances had never been cleaned, the bathrooms were literally rusty and moldy. It was a disaster very disappointing. So pretty quickly, we get on the phone with the management company, <clears throat> but remember, it's Sunday evening, and so nobody's there, nobody picks up, nobody's available, and it's looking like we're not going to be able to get any kind of refund, at least right now. So, all right, just roll up our sleeves and try to make the most of this. So I run down to the store, I thought, I'm going to get some cleaning products and some laundry detergent. I'm just going to wash everything and try to get this, this place usable, you know? <clears throat> to come back from the store with all our cleaning products, take pictures, right? You got to document the disaster and then start washing the sheets and the towels and I'm vacuuming and mopping and disinfecting the surfaces and degreasing the kitchen. It's just more effort and labor than any of us should ever have to do to start our stay at a vacation place like Airbnb, you know? So we go through all this. It's like 1130 at night by the time we get the house anywhere close to inhabitable and we're exhausted. All the house grime is on us from sweating and cleaning all evening. And we're, we're grossed out. I feel anxious. Are we going to get sick from all this disgusting house stuff? And I'm angry and I'm, you know, bummed that my daughter's so tired that she hasn't gone to bed yet. And I'm worried she's not going to get enough sleep. And so it's just a terrible situation. We call it a night. I don't really want to sleep there, but we try. We sleep poorly. And the next day we wake up and just agree, this house is unredeemable. This is not going to work. And so it would honestly, no exaggeration here, it would need professional carpet and furniture extraction. Like, you know, that metal wand that you, you know, sucks out the stuff in the carpet. It needs that for days. It needs thousands of dollars uh, of investment to become a usable place of rest and peace. It needed new beds and lamps and doors and dressers, and it needed hours of deep cleaning and just so much work to get this to a, a, a usable position. So we pack up, we get out of there as quickly as we can, and we head straight to the management office Monday morning. <clears throat> we kindly argue our way back to a partial refund, showing all the pictures, like, look how bad this is. We give the keys back, and we say, you know what, we're done. I can't. We switch to a much cleaner Marriott a few miles down the road, which was really lovely, and that worked out fine for us. And I just hope that nobody ever has to go through anything like that on their vacation. We paid for that place, you know? We put real money on that. This was supposed to be our temporary home for a very special family gathering, a great memory. 
but it was nothing more than a disgusting disappointment. And there's something about that Tahoe rental experience that helps me to connect with Mark's story of Jesus' triumphal entry, Mark's account of Jesus coming home. This story is normally seen as the, like I said, the triumphal entry and a temple cleansing where Jesus comes to the capital, to the king's home with great public anticipation, with celebration and optimism. But when he walks into his house, he looks around, kind of takes inventory, he too leaves in quiet disappointment, like Tahoe. That then, very interestingly, we'll see this when we read, that turns into a prophetic curse that he acts out for his disciples to understand the cleansing that he would then do. And all of that points forward to a whole new way of connecting with God. That's kind of a summary of our passage today. I hope we see that as, as we uh, read through our text and study it today. And I've got to admit, in my, my sermon prep over the past couple of weeks, I went in assuming that I already knew the point of this famous Palm Sunday story. But as I studied, I, I learned a ton. I was really humbled by the Lord, and I needed to rewrite a lot of ideas and illustrations and came out of this realizing that it's saying something pretty different than what I thought. <clears throat> and so I want to invite you to discover that with me this morning. Let's look into this passage and try to find the, the message that Jesus actually intended through, this, through Mark's narrative of his triumphal entry. And that message is this. When the king came home, he would cleanse it in a way that would reconnect us with God. When the king came home, he would clean house, clear it out, in order to make a whole new way of relating with God. That's what Mark 11 is about. We're going to study Mark 11, 1 through 25, and because that's a lot of verses, and because it's saying something different than what we might expect going into it, I want to make sure we have a really good preview, a really good you know, feeling of structure and kind of handrails as we study today. So check this out. This is our outline for today. This is what we're going to be looking at. The first section is about the king coming home. Cel- Jesus is celebrated as king. The second part, we're going to see that he curses a fig tree. Third, he's going to cleanse the temple. You probably know that story. And then f- the fourth part is that he's going to show us a whole new way to connect with God. So that's where we're going today. Hopefully that gives us a sense of direction. Let's get into it. Look at verses 1 through 11 with me. Mark 11, 1 through 11. Let's read, either on the screen or in your Bibles. Verse 1, Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away, and they found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many, the crowd, spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Okay, this whole section, this first 11 verses, the main thing they're doing, loud and clear in so many ways, flashing neon lights, bold font, all caps, is saying that Jesus is king. And so let's look at a few of the ways that it's doing that to make sure that we are rightly seeing, receiving, conceiving of Jesus as king as he wants to present himself. First, before this passage, we didn't read this, but in your reading throughout the week of Mark, you would see a blind man sitting on the side of the road as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, and he's shouting, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, you are the Messiah. That's what that means. 
Even the blind man is announcing Jesus as king, coming into this triumphal entry. That's the first thing. Second way this screams Jesus as king is the entire arrangement or the plan with the donkey. That actually points to Jesus as king too. For these reasons, animals in the Bible, there are at least three passages that show this, that are set aside for divine usage, for God's purposes. Those animals would generally be untouched, unused. So the fact that this donkey has not been ridden yet, that's saying Jesus is a king from God. He is God's king. <clears throat> Secondly, King Solomon did the same thing in his coronation back in 1 Kings 1. Jesus is echoing what King Solomon did. Zechariah 9 prophesies that the Messiah, the Christ, the king, he would ride a donkey. Jesus is fulfilling that, pointing to Christ as king. Culturally, lastly, it was understood that even Roman officials could impress, that's, the, that's what that's called, impress an animal owner and say, hey, I need this for official business. Kind of like in a movie when a, a, there's a car chase scene going on and a cop flashes their badge and you're like, I need your car. You know, it's, like, it's kind of like that. <clears throat> Except uh, Jesus gives the donkey back at the end. He's a, he's a kind king. And so even a non-Jewish Roman citizen should be able to see Jesus with that kind of authority like their officials, like their soldiers, like their legions, remember that? Like their emperor could do. It's painting Jesus in all of that authoritative light, pointing to him as king. Third, the way that the disciples get the donkey, <clears throat> that points to his kingship too. Literarily, there's a structure here called the command fulfillment pattern. You see this all throughout biblical narrative. When uh, uh, somebody is giving an instruction, um, telling you to do something, and then it is fulfilled verbatim exactly, that's called command fulfillment pattern, and that's pointing to somebody with authority. You see this Old Testament and New. And that's exactly what's happening here. This, the way this is written is showing that Jesus is this authoritative king. Okay? Fourth, even the branches and the cloaks point to Jesus' kingship. Because that's like a red carpet treatment for royalty. That's exactly what happened to King Jehu in 2 Kings 9. This is what happened to the, the Jewish leaders in the Maccabean era between the Testaments as well. <clears throat> when they would reclaim a city or, or win a battle. Red carpet points to king. And then fifth, the people in this procession are literally announcing his royalty in Hosanna. In that cry of praise. In blessed is the coming, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. That word Hosanna, like I said, is a shout of praise uh, and a cry that means please save. God, save us now. And that is revealing the crowd's hope, expectation that Jesus might be the Messiah. This might be the guy that's finally going to save us. He's finally going to release us from Roman oppression and restore political peace in Israel. Now, even though they are saying, Hosanna, King of David, they're, they're, they're shouting these true things about Jesus, there's like a hint that they don't totally know what that means. They don't totally get it. <clears throat> they're quoting Psalm 118. They're kind of shouting this nationalistic sentiment. There's a lot of hype mixed with some mix, misconception. And we wonder, is, is Jesus cool with that? Is that all right that they don't? totally get it? Because up to this point, he's, he's told people to hold on, be quiet. Don't, don't go talk about this. After he heals somebody, after he frees people from demons, he'll often say, don't, don't say any word of this, right? <clears throat> but now the word is out. It's immediately becoming very public, and Jesus doesn't seem to be stopping it, right? Why is that? He's okay with it, because the prep work for this scene has just been done. He just finished teaching and teaching and teaching the whole profile of what this king was meant to be, what he came to do. In chapters 8 and 9 and 10, he said three times, this king came to die and to rise. That's something that they maybe didn't expect their king to do. They thought they were going to install a political leader to immediately bring him to a place of prosperity and freedom. Die? What are you talking about? So Jesus had to correct that and say, I'm going to die, rise. Three times. And then even now, he comes into his city, his home, the place where the king of Israel is meant to rule and reign. And he is pointed directly at the cross where five days later, he would lay down his life to Hosanna to save his people 
from sin and death. So he has shown us. He has told us exactly what kind of king he is. And it's on us to see that, to receive that, to believe it. And this should be pushing us, church, to ask the question, are we conceiving rightly of Jesus as king? Or do I have a picture of Jesus that's maybe tailored by misconception, edited by my own expectations? Do I have this concept of king that's from, you know, Netflix or the History Channel, like a stuffy 1500s British guy looking pasty, whiter than me, up on a throne, all, uh, all rich and disconnected from the people? Or is our concept of king more like a military mastermind that's going to move pieces around and end wars and conflicts and create our idea of world peace? <clears throat> Or is our idea of king more like an American political candidate that we hope to install all the ideas and laws and policies, values that we hold dear? Is that our idea of king? There's some of that stuff going on in this Palm Sunday Hosanna crowd. But Jesus wants us to understand his kingship as a king who healed and touched and loved and stopped for people who were rejected by society. <clears throat> he wants us to understand that he is a king who held all the power of heaven to calm the storms, to cast out demons, to restore sight, to bring the dead back to life. He wants us to understand he's a king who taught with unprecedented authority, with soul-piercing insight, with jaw-dropping wisdom. He wants us to see that he is a ruler who would order his kingdom in a very unexpected way, upholding honor, Honoring humility and dependence over wealth and power and self-sufficiency. And this is a king who would die for his own people, for all who would trust in him, that sins might be forgiven, that new life, that wholeness, that peace with God might be graciously granted in his resurrection. We have seen this all throughout our study of Mark. And now here in this public announcement of Jesus' kingship, on Palm Sunday, we are being called to understand and adopt his definition of king, not impose our own, not make him fit our picture, not just welcome him with empty hype, with like, and everybody's doing it energy, not just with ceremonial gestures we think we're supposed to be doing, but in faith and truth and conviction to see and to announce this king is special. This is the son of the most high. This king is the one for whom and by whom and through whom all creation was made. This is the rightful ruler and savior of the world. This is the only king deserving of our full allegiance and affection and attention. This is the lamb of God. That is our king. Amen? Amen. And so once we see Jesus that way, once we have the right concept of our king, we can be prepared for what's next. Rightly seeing Christ makes everything after this make way more sense. And it puts us in a better position to see what he's, what he's really doing next with the tree, with the temple, and all of that. If we don't have the right concept of king, we're probably going to think that what Jesus is about to do is weird or wrong even. And so let's hold on to this picture of King Jesus, and keep it in mind, and then take it with us into the next section, where in verse 11, Jesus enters Jerusalem. He goes straight into the temple area. He looks around. He quietly evaluates, takes stock, and then leaves quietly, and that should leave us wondering, what is he thinking? It's kind of like, a, like an auditor, a food critic, a supervisor, taking notes quietly, holding it. And then the next day, he shares it with his disciples. And he shares it with his disciples in, in kind of a surprising way. <clears throat> it's very interesting because he acts it out. He demonstrates it. You might not expect this. Let's read that in verse 12. Look at 12 through 14 with me. <clears throat> On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if, it could, if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he could find nothing but leaves, 
for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. What? What is that about? Is Jesus pointlessly losing his temper here? Is he just destroying this poor innocent out of season tree because he's like hangry or something? Is, is he wasting a miracle to kill this little plant? What is he doing? Like, if he's hungry, just talk to it nicely and say, hey, make some fruit for me or something. You know, you know he could do that, but he doesn't. Why? Because it's not really about the tree. The tree's about something else. The tree is a prophetic parable for the temple. The tree is a prophetic parable for the temple. It's a living, standing picture of what is going to happen next. And it explains everything Jesus was about to do when he goes into his house. Here's why. You remember the names of the cities that we passed through in verse 1? Those are like, those are big clues to understanding what this means. It's like Easter eggs in a movie that pay off later. Those cities were Bethany and Beth Phage. Beth Phage, that's how you pronounce it. It's a Hebrew Aramaic word translated into Greek. Beth Phage means house. Beth is house. Phage is unripe figs. Huh. Accident? Nope. <clears throat> and two, Bethany, the other city, can be translated a few different ways. But I think Mark is pointing to an Aramaic or Hebrew rendering that would be pronounced Beth Ta'ena. That means house of normal figs. <clears throat> so you have two fig house cities. And I think there's this, that, that motif, that theme of figs and houses is really being put on the reader's radar here. Because not only are the cities named that, but Jesus has just come through these fig house cities out of the temple, which is what? House of the Lord, okay? And now he's come out of this house to a fig tree. It all fits together. Just as he came up to the temple with a type of hunger, with an expectation that there's going to be something fruitful, productive, useful on this tree. But he finds both pretending to be alive. Now, to be fair, Mark points out for us really clearly, it's not fig season, but what he's doing is marking the calendar for the time of year when it would have leaves. He said that. <clears throat> and it should have little green prefigs. It should have little, little fig bud types of things that, that, that would become ripe and useful and edible later in the year. It should have some indication uh, that it would become fruitful later. But there's not even a hint of that, that this thing would ever be any good. So look at it this way. This tree has just welcomed Jesus the same way the city did. With leafy branches and little else. Does that make sense? There needs to be more than external decoration, garnish, hype. There needs to be real fruit that would fulfill its purpose as a fig tree. <clears throat> and it has failed that. And so Jesus puts an end to it by cursing it. It's not a temper, it's a tantrum, it's not a magical spell, it's not profanity, anything like that. It's not an impulsive act of rage. He simply spoke to it authoritatively and said, never again. We've all done something like that in our own context, right? Think about that for a second. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to start up a business? You're grinding, trying to get a profit. Ah, it's just not going well. We gotta pull the plug. Have you ever pulled your child out of a school that wasn't teaching them well or treating them right? You said never again to that one restaurant where you got real bad service or maybe food poisoning. I'm not going back there. My neighbor, uh, similarly, he works on cars a lot, and one day he was helping me out with a, a project on my car, and we were holding this part that I need to replace, and I'm like, uh, I saw it for this price at this store. He said, oh, we'll never go there. We don't go there. They have cheap parts. They don't last. Go here instead. <clears throat> he quit on that parts store. 
There are all kinds of institutions that disappoint us, and there's a point where all of us would say, enough, I'm done with that. It's not working for me. I can't trust it. I can't rely on it. it that just doesn't do its job, you know? And we all know it's okay to back away from those types of places and just try something else. That's what Jesus is doing here. And more with this fig tree, which represents the temple. In a live, enacted, prophetic parable to show his disciples what would come next. Does that make sense so far? I hope, it, I hope we're kind of getting there. But for a little more clarity, let's look into verses 15 to 19. Maybe this will come out a little more so we can see how those, those ideas of king and curse help us understand the, the temple situation. Let's look at verse 15. <clears throat> and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. You know, for as long <clears throat> as I can remember, I thought this was about Jesus cleaning, clearing out the temple to restore its original purpose. I thought this was about calling out commercialization, commodifying faith, or desecrating a very special space. I thought this was about rebuking money changers and merchants who might have been profiting off of poor out-of-towners, marking up products like movie theater popcorn, you know? kind of stealing from people who couldn't bring the right currency or sacrifices with them on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. <clears throat> I also thought it was about clearing out through traffic, make way, get out, because people were dragging their, their cargo, making a bunch of noise, clunking around this temple court, irreverently treating it like a casual shortcut, clogging it up, preventing worshipers from getting in to, to pray. I thought it was about that. Did Jesus do those things literally? Yes, he did. He did. He moved all that out. But that's not necessarily the specific target of his actions. That's not really telling us why he did it. The real key to understanding why he was doing this and where his intensity was focused is in those two Old Testament passages we talked about. <clears throat> Come back to that in a second. Why am I saying that? Because Jesus drove the customers out too, didn't he? It wasn't just the merchants, the money changers. It was the people buying. Why would he do that? And also, it wasn't even a sinful thing necessarily to sell doves or exchange money. That's kind of a convenience to the worshipers. It would be hard to pack a whole thing of birds with you when you're traveling, you know, 40 miles on a donkey or something. That's tough. So it's kind of nice to be able to buy that once you get into town. And by the way, the profit margin on those transactions was like 4 to 8%. That's better than Los Angeles sales tax. Not that bad. So that's not it. That's not necessarily what Jesus was angry about. He wasn't necessarily directing his intensity at the selling and buying. His focus and target, like I said, becomes very clear when we look at the Old Testament passages he was quoting. In verse 17, look at this. He references Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. We have to talk about that in order to understand what Jesus was doing in his flipping tables and driving people out. Isaiah 56 is all about how foreigners, outsiders, non-Jews thought I was, they were excluded from God's salvation plan. But in a really beautiful way, Isaiah 56 says, no, actually... You can't have a relationship with the Lord. Those who join themselves to the Lord, it says, love his name. Those who minister to the Lord and will be his servants, I will bring them into Jerusalem and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And in that same chapter, just a few verses later, Isaiah is calling out the leaders. He calls them watchmen, shepherds. He says, these guys have no understanding. They are blind. 
They come only to devour and get drunk. And so this is talking about how there has to be a way for outsiders, for the world, to come to God, despite very poor leadership in Israel and its temple. That's Isaiah 56. Hold on to that. Jeremiah 7, the den of robbers part, that's all about people who were overconfident in the temple, thinking we can live however we want, we can sin it up and and worship false gods, we can oppress and exploit people, we can commit adultery and lie and kill and just be terrible, who cares? But as long as we have this special building, we'll be fine. As long as the temple stays here, as long as we run to it, we'll be safe from God's judgment. Jeremiah says, that's not how this works, guys. Are you kidding me? He says, you live in blatant sin out there? And you think you can come to safety and hide in this temple? That's like bandits in an old western running out to the desert from the sheriff and hiding in a cave. That's the den of robbers. He's not saying the merchants themselves are robbing people. He's saying those who live in unrepentant sin and come here thinking religious practices will save them from God's judgment. That's like criminals in a hideout. And so Jesus is directing his actions at those who have reduced God and his house to a superstition, to nothing more than a little token of security while never actually dealing with their own wickedness and evil. Taking God and his grace for granted and then getting in the way of outsiders connecting with the Lord. That is not being a beacon, a light to the nation. That's not testifying to God's greatness. It's not helping the world come into the house of the Lord in prayer and worship. It's disgusting. It's disappointing. It's fruitless, ineffective, barren, empty, false religion that has to come to an end. That is what Jesus is concerned with here. That's what needs to be called out and cleared out so that all people can come and connect with God. That's what he's flipping the tables on. That's what he's pushing out of his house. Now, is he doing this to clean it up and try again in the temple? No. Is he doing this to reform it and put new protocols in place, maybe post some signage and some traffic markers so people aren't getting in the way, clogging it up, and set price limits on the birds and like, okay, now everything's fine? No. This king has come to his home and is doing exactly what he did to the fig tree. And he makes that very clear right around the corner, two chapters later in Mark 13. Look at this. Very pointed. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, You see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus did not prune the fig tree. He didn't get those little square sticks with the green tape and prop it up and kind of manicure it and hope, Oh, maybe this thing will come around. It had its time. It had its season. It was not working. It was not productive. It was not fruitful. It failed, so he ended it. And he said, never again. In the same way, Jesus was not trying to cleanse the temple in a renewing, purifying, let's get this thing back up and running kind of way. Jesus is cleansing Jerusalem of the temple. Jesus is knocking down the whole system. Jesus is flipping over the tables where we try to pay for sacrifice and says, in five days, this is done. And so I hope, SBCC, we can see what this is saying to us. Is this telling us that selling sweatshirts in the lobby or making coffee in the back of the well is a sin? No. Is this saying that ushers who walk around in the worship center, the tech team who comes out on stage, or maybe people who need to get up and go to the bathroom or get your kid, that you're, being a, uh, you're a problem that's going to hinder us from prayer, from worship? No, go to the bathroom, you're fine. Okay. Is this saying 
Fundraisers are bad. Is this talking about distractions in general? No. This is about fruitless religious facade that tries to buy God's favor. This is about hiding unrepentant sin under leafy branches of superficial church busyness meant to secure salvation. This is about thinking that the duration of my membership, how much I give or volunteer, my position as a leader, how many studies I attend throughout the week, thinking that's the thing that's going to keep me safe from God's judgment. This is about getting spiritually lazy, too comfortable, assuming because I was baptized back in the day, I don't have to deal with my sinful habits anymore. I don't have to let the spirit work on me and transform my character. Who cares? This is about an easy believism that excuses unrighteousness and takes God's grace for granted. This is is about saying, I said a prayer once and I got the presence of God forever. I'm good to go. I don't need to grow. It's about that. That is what Jesus is kicking out, chopping down. So the point of this passage is that none of that works. That's not it. That's not fruitful. Only Jesus makes us safe from God's wrath for our sin. Only Jesus makes us right with the Father. Only Jesus secures salvation for us. And because he did all of that for us, we then live holy and fruitfully for him. We understand that God has placed a calling on our lives individually and corporately as a church, enabling us to be productive for his purposes, useful in his mission, contributing to the kingdom of Christ. And so when he walks up to us as a church, would he look at our branches and say, yes, that's fruitful. This is who you are meant to be. This is what I made you to do. And if we think otherwise, if we continue in our unrepentant sin, yet keep trying to do rote religious things like popping coins into a machine to maybe keep it going, we're doing the same activity that Jesus kicked out of the temple. May that not be us, church. Let me be really clear, though. Jesus is not going to destroy his church, but he will purify it. This is his bride, who he died for, who he rose for, who he has filled with his Holy Spirit, who he is strengthening and empowering. He loves us. He comforts us. He counsels us. He teaches us. He is sanctifying us. Ephesians 5, he is, oh, this is beautiful. He's washing us with the water of his word, eager to present us in splendor without spot or blemish that we might be holy. Let's welcome that cleansing work of Christ. Let's invite him to rid us of anything we don't need anymore, anything hindering others from seeing him clearly as king. Anything in us still holding on to an old religious system that spits in the face of the sacrifice that he paid for at the cross. Any attempts to earn salvation on our own. Anything in what we do or how we do it that causes us to overlook and forget and miss the point that it's all about him. It's all because of him. It's all for him that he might be known and that souls might come to him and be saved. Let's let Jesus curse that Take it down, overturn that table, and clean it out. Amen? Amen. That is what the king came to do. We have seen that that kind of king came home to his home. We have seen that he has cursed a tree that represents that unfruitful sacrificial system. We have seen him begin to cleanse his home city of a distorted, degraded way of relating to God. And the disciples have seen all this, and they're wondering, okay, but what do we do next? That whole system has been the centerpiece of Jewish faith for millennia. That's all we've known. We've always been doing that. That's what we've always done in the past. And so if that's gone... What's going to take its place? How how, how are we supposed to connect with God now? Let's see how Jesus explains that in verse 20. Let's look at verse 20 to 25. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, 
The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father who also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Man, I thought we figured out the, most of this passage and then we get to this. You're like, what does this mean? This is tough. Is this, a, is this a name it and claim it kind of text? Is this saying that if you would just have enough faith, your prayers would really be answered? Is this saying if you can finally get rid of your doubts, if you can try really hard and picture the results, envision the outcome, then you could perform miracles. Is it saying that? If these verses weren't connected to the temple and the tree, maybe we could say that, but we've got to read it in context. Mark has shown us that the fig tree represents the temple. It has been cursed, rendered useless, brought down to its roots. And when Peter points that out, he says, hey, look, there's that tree again. Jesus starts talking about mountains and prayer and forgiveness. Feels like he's talking right past Peter, ignoring this tree observation. And it doesn't make sense, changing the subject. But keep in mind where they are. Check this out. This is a picture of Jerusalem. Right now, we are standing on the Mount of Olives. That's where this picture is taken from, looking at the temple, right? <clears throat> I want to thank Pastor Gary for this picture. This is one of his from his Israel visit. And this helps us to see that Jesus is still very on topic, actually. Because where's the temple? It's on a mountain. Where's this tree stump now? It's on a mountain. So Jesus has not changed the subject. Jesus says, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will be done for you. And so, this is teaching that the Mount of Olives, or the Temple Mount, it's both symbolizing the same thing. They're both figures for the center of Judaism and its sacrificial system. Those will be uprooted, cast into the sea to its end, to its death, drowning in a watery grave, just like the fig tree. And so the message in all of this is, instead of trusting in the temple, the old mode of relating to God here is a new way. Trust in the Lord himself, in his miraculous power, and the forgiveness that he gives. This is saying we're done making pilgrimages to a building to connect with God. We're not going to pay for sacrifices anymore. That's over. That is being cut down, cast out, and uprooted and thrown into the place of the dead. Now we relate to the Lord, we connect with God by praying in faith, by believing in his power, and by practicing forgiveness. Does that make sense? This is the new way. In other words, once this building, this tree, this mountain, once that is out of the way, there is going to be a completely new spiritual building founded on the cornerstone of Christ. It says that just a few verses later. A cornerstone who would be the final and only sacrifice who could make sufficient payment for the forgiveness of our sins, yet be raised to life by God's mountain-moving power. This is the good news, and this is telling us to believe in that gospel with all of your heart. This is saying, come into that house of prayer built by Jesus and on Jesus alone. Pray with that kind of faith in God who can do the impossible, bring life out of death. Forgive because he has forgiven you through Jesus at the cross. This is what that king came to establish. This is why he had to come home and curse the tree and cleanse the temple to clear out and make a whole new way to connect with God. 
through forgiveness and resurrection power. Can I close with one more thought as we wrap up? I really hope that this is not an allegorical reach. I don't quite know if Mark explicitly intended this, but I can't unsee this canonical connection. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they cover themselves with? Just as the sacrificial system was never meant to fully, completely, eternally pay for our sins, neither have fig leaves ever been good enough to cover our guilt and our shame. That is as true today as it was in Mark 11, as it was in Genesis 3. And the message has always been, only God can clothe us in a way that truly covers, in a way that really reclaims us, and brings us back into relationship with him, in a way that protects us and gives us hope and a future And he does that through this King Jesus, yeah? And so may we see and celebrate that King Jesus and receive him as the one who came to do that for us at the cross, earning the forgiveness that we're supposed to practice. May we say, Hosanna, save us in real faith and pure devotion with conviction and with true understanding. May we abandon any, every effort to cover our sin with fig leaves, with religious facade. May we never try to pay for sacrifices that Jesus has already made. May we never take his grace for granted, but may we trust that Jesus alone saves us by his miraculous, mountain-moving resurrection power and by the forgiveness that he purchased in his blood at the cross, bringing us to life, empowering us and commanding us to be fruitful by his spirit, productive for his purpose, useful in his mission, to welcome all people, all nations, into his presence through prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, first of all, we want to confess you as king. Not our concept of king, Lord, but a king who was gentle and kind and loving, who was patient, who was good, right, just, fair, pure, who touched and healed, who restored vision, who brought dead to life. We worship you as that king. We see that that king is good and we say welcome in, Lord Jesus. You are the one who saves Hosanna to the king, the son of David, our Messiah, the promised Christ. And we fully, arms wide open, accept you as the one who has every right to clear out what doesn't work, what's not connecting us with God, what's any sin that's unrepented getting in the way. Any of our efforts to pay for this on our own Kick it out, Lord. Cleanse us. Purify us of that. Wash us. And we invite you, Lord, to raise us up and push us forward to be productive and fruitful for your purpose, your mission, that all nations might come to you in prayer and in faith, understanding the forgiveness that you have purchased for us at the cross. And so we lay ourselves before your throne, King Jesus, saying, here we are. Take our minds, take our hands, our bodies, our hearts, all that we have so that we can be useful for you. We give you control because you deserve it. We want to live for you and you alone because you are king. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We proclaim this truth with prayer and with song. In Jesus' name, amen.